So here's the problem. If you're a dividend investor, typically 2% yields are what you see in your everyday ETFs. In fact, even the S&P 500 has averaged a dividend yield of only 2%. But wouldn't it be nice to earn higher dividend yield? Well, today we're exploring four different type of ETFs that yield anywhere from 5 to 9% in dividend yields. Oh wait, there's an even better part. They pay every single month in dividend distributions. And yet again, they're actually a little bit different than what we've talked about on the channel before because they are a representation of what we call closed-ended funds. Now typically, closed-ended funds are an investment that you buy directly into. It's kind of like it's a mutual fund. But today, I have ETFs that hold a variety of closed-ended funds that can provide more options and a little bit less risk sometimes. Now, a lot of investors, they go into closed-ended funds for the higher distribution yields. On top of that, most CEFs offer that monthly dividend payment, which is a lot better than a typical ETF that will maybe only pay you once every quarter. So before I get to these four ETFs, I think it's important to discuss what actually is a closed-ended fund. What does that mean and how is that different from the typical open market, the ETFs, the stocks, and everything else that you might be used to buying? Now, of course, if you are already familiar with closed-ended funds and you want to jump right to that top four ETFs that I'm recommending with that 5 to 9% yield, jump to this timestamp right here. Otherwise, if you want to understand it, because there are some important things to know, stay tuned. So we'll do this just like we always do our versus videos. Over here, we'll talk about these closed-ended funds, these new things that we're talking about on the channel today. And over here, we'll talk about the open-ended funds. And these are the ones that you're probably most familiar with, your ETFs, your stocks, things like that. I, I think this is the primary difference, and we'll get right to it, right to the point. Over here, open-ended funds typically always allow new buyers, whereas closed-ended funds, and the reason they're called closed-ended, is they have a limited amount of shares. And their goal is, because they're not always accepting capital, they're trying to initially raise capital for an IPO, IPO being an initial public offering. This means with a closed-ended fund, because they're limited in shares, they are not going to continue to offer more shares. So for example, in an open-ended market, you and I buy shares and we keep buying and then some other people over here start buying and then some other people over here start buying. They keep issuing new shares as more demand and more buying occurs in the market. But a closed-ended fund, once all of those shares are bought up, let's say they only offer unrealistic but 100 shares. Once all 100 shares are bought, they're not offering any more shares at all. The only way to buy shares in the future of this particular closed-ended fund is if somebody sells them, let's say they sell two shares of the 100 shares, well, then those two shares are out in the open market for you to buy. But once you buy them, it's on a standstill until somebody else sells out in the closed-ended fund. But that also comes with its own little thing to think about. You know, with an open-ended fund, they have to have cash available because you may decide at any moment to sell your shares. And if you sell your shares, they need to be able to pay you and buy back the shares. Closed-ended funds don't buy back shares. It just goes to the open market. Doesn't mean you can't sell your shares if you own CEFs. It's just that the company themselves do not have to pay you back, whereas these guys over here, they have to pay to buy back your shares when you want to sell them. That means it could be anywhere from about eight to 10% cash on hand of a particular ETF. They're not going to invest their entire 100% of the capital that they raise into the different various investments, which means that not all 100% is invested, whereas in a close-handed fund, every single dollar typically that they make gets invested into their growth. Now with an open-ended fund, they'll use their net asset value as a means of calculating what their real market is based on their investments held by the fund. Closed-ended funds trade throughout the day in the stock exchange. Now what this actually means is that its market-driven price may differ from its net asset value. This means a CEF can trade at a premium, meaning more than its NAV, or a discount, meaning less than its NAV. So a CEF's fund or market price may actually be driven higher than their NAV based on, let's say, it's a sector that people are most interested in. So investors are kind of flocking to that. Maybe it's technology or something of that nature. Or there's a fund manager over that CEF that is well-respected. So they're getting a lot of influx of cash. On the inverse of that, you could have something that maybe is underperforming and investors are a little bit scared of it. They're saying, hey, that's a bit risky. I'm staying away from it. So therefore, it's at a discount to its NAV, meaning it's trading less than its net asset value. What all this means for beginners, closed-ended funds can be a little bit more volatile than the open market, just something to keep in mind. 
Now, one thing that both of these sides have in common are fees. Oh yes, they come with the fees, the expense ratios, and everything else that you're typically used to when you buy into ETFs and mutual funds and things like that. Most close-ended funds are actively managed, so they will come with a rather high expense ratio. In fact, sometimes an absolutely insane expense ratio, but the trade-off to that should be that they are actually distributing about up to 90% of their net income in the form of dividends and distributions. So really, you gotta do your own calculation to see if the expense ratio versus the dividend makes it worth it or not. Speaking of that 90%, to remain as tax-free as possible, what they do is they pass that tax burden on to us, the shareholders, in a closed-end fund. So because that tax burden is passed on to the shareholders, you may be hit with an unnecessary tax bill, so make sure you're doing your own calculations to make sure that you're taking the best advantage of the tax based on your financial situation. And that brings us to the top four ETFs that are focused on closed-ended funds that pay very, very nice percentages of dividend yields, and they pay every single month. So let's start with the lowest yield and we'll climb our way up to the number four, which is the highest paying dividend yield. This could be a great way to diversify your portfolio, get some extra income going on, get some extra dividend yield. Here is number four, and that is ticker symbol FCEF. It pays a 5.1% dividend yield, pays around nine to 10 cents per share per month. So it currently goes for $25.19 per share as of the recording of this video. And if you think about it, a $10,000 initial investment when the fund started in 2017 would be worth $15,861 today with dividends reinvested. And that represents an overall return of 10.2% over that period of time. Not too bad because there is actually a recession in that in March 2020, so it's nice to see an overall growth of 10% even with that downturn. Now brace yourself, this expense ratio comes in at 2.91%. Whoa, that's high. But it's to be expected with closed-ended funds. And remember, because they're actively managed and that's the trade-off for that high income with the high expense, as I mentioned earlier. This fund holds 50 closed-ended funds with 4.27% of the holdings going to the EV Tax Advantage Global Dividend Incorporated. Now let's move on to the next one at a 6.6% dividend yield and that is ticker PCEF. This one pays around 13 cents every single month per share that you own and it currently goes for $24.19 per share. Now, taking your $10,000 initial investment, if you would have done the same thing with PCEF, with the fund starting in 2011, this would now be worth a whopping $21,433 today, representing a 7.35% total return. Now, this fund holds a total of 128 closed-ended funds, with the top holding as the EV Tax Managed Dividend Equity Income Fund. The expense ratio for PCEF, it's a little bit cheaper than the one previously at 2.34% expense ratio. Let's move this up a little bit. Let's move this up to an 8.8% dividend yield, and that is with tinker symbol Y, Y, Y. It's currently going for $17.07 .07 per share, and this fund is paying out 12 to 13 cents per month per share. Not too bad. The fund holds 46 closed-ended funds, with the most invested in Oxford Lane at 3.4%. Back to our initial $10,000 investment, if you would have made this in YYY. When the fund started in 2013, today it'd be worth $16,514, representing a 5.9% return, kind of the lowest compared to the other two that we just mentioned. But as you can see, a higher dividend yield sometimes represents a lower overall return. The expense ratio for this one, 2.45%. But now, ladies and gentlemen, or according to my YouTube analytics, ladies and gentlemen, the 9.1% dividend yield is ticker symbol CEFS close-ended fund, CEFS. Hey, that's easy to remember, isn't it? 9.1% fund is trading right now for $21.76 per share, paying out 14 cents per share per month every single month. That fund holds 44 close-ended funds with the top being the five-year treasury note. That's kind of interesting. An initial $10,000 investment with this fund starting in 2018 will be worth 13,576, representing a nice 8.46% growth. Expense ratio on this one is a whopping 3.8%. So this one is obviously the king of expense ratios uh, as opposed to everything else that we just looked at. But the nice thing about these four ETFs is that they represent the closed-ended fund environment. So CEFs, when you're buying them directly, can be a little bit more risky. So why not own a basket of CEFs in the ETF format. That's the beauty of the four that we explored today if you're into this type of thing with dividend investing. Now, the next thing you need to do is check out this video for a 10% dividend yield and then this one on how you can make $1,000 per month in dividends. And until next time, we'll see you on the next video.